Hey, Aubrey. Yeah. You want to jump on the Zoom meeting? I want to test a couple things. And we are recording. Hello, folks. Uh, we'll be getting started here shortly. I know there's no one else out there right now, which is all right with me. We have a small class today. And we're going to do mostly of it through the computer sharing my screen, so we'll get started here shortly. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't have to. So I'm sharing my screen, but you're not seeing my screen. You're not seeing the screen that I thought I was sharing. Right. Get back. Can you come here a second. You, you've done a lot more Zoom than I have. Um, well, I see Aubrey there. Um, so I've got, oh, okay. That's where the control is. I was clicking on it. I was only getting like these oh, options. The All right. So like the one that, yeah. area, that one should, that should do it. Severin is that issue before as well. So it's just not seen the same. And how, and how do you, how do you show the whole, oh, man. show the whole screen? Um, I mean, show the desktop. I thought there was a. I've never done that before. Hold control to select multiple windows. I don't know. That would be helpful. Maybe just scroll up all of them, but I don't know. Just show two at once, maybe? Or... Okay, Aubrey, are you seeing my. Slack. Yep. yep, I can see that now. All right, cool. Thanks, Zach. Mm -hmm. Well, now we have someone joining us. Welcome, Carla. We'll be getting started here in a couple minutes. We'll give some others some time to join in the fun here. Where are you calling in from, Carla? I'm in Howell. Oh, OK. Awesome.
Now I gotta get back to my my sharing screen. Hi, Laura. Welcome. We'll be getting started here shortly. Uh, if you guys want to open your chat window, can I? You're muted there, Aubrey. Oh, that's better. Uh, yeah, if you guys want to open your chat windows, uh, you'll be able to see any answers we get in here or ask questions that way. You see my um, my slide there, the opening slide? That's great. Mm, yes. All right. We'll wait just a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. So we're gonna be primarily doing things just through the uh, computer screen and sharing a uh, presentation that way. And then there'll be a little bit of show and tell of Aubrey's bike setup and my bike setup as well, as Aubrey is showing you there briefly so you can kind of see our commuter bikes Laura and Carla have you um, taken any of the other classes or Sorry, this is this is Laura. Yeah, um, I took um, greasing your chain and um, oh boy, my brain's not working well today. Uh, <laughs> probably the one right after that. <laughs> okay. oh, good. Oh, adjust, adjustments to uh, brakes and that kind of thing. Oh, okay, great. Did any of that? Uh, did you try put any of it to use? I have not yet, um, and, but I, I can go back and rewatch them. I, um, I live on the second floor of an apartment building and I'm kind of surrounded by snow right now and I haven't felt like carrying my bike down to uh, try anything with it. Yeah. Yeah, not all of us have nice home workshops. And I, I mean, I've been messing around with bikes for so many years that I've, I've had a workshop in my garage for the past yes. 30 or more. And I finally am getting a, a workshop set up in my basement so I can work in the warmth and comfort of my home. <laughs> Very good. And Aubrey, Aubrey, I think, has a nice workshop in his basement now that he's got a nice big home. Yeah, I do. Um, so it's nice to have it uh, heated and be able to keep the bikes out of the weather. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll just get started since uh, you know it's, it was a small class of people that had registered and uh, they can always go back and watch recording, which might be what they're thinking. So we'll just get started here without waiting any further. So thanks for, for joining us. And uh, as the screen shows, this is gonna be talking about the basics of bike commuting. And that's our, our web page web address for our homepage. Uh, and that page below is uh, a link on our on our uh, blog, which talks about all the commuter benefits that we have at the university, which uh, are also open. To, some of them are also of use to people that may not be necessarily commuting to and from MSU. So if you go to msubikes.wordpress.com, uh, let's see, are you seeing my computer screen here? Yes. 
All right, so this is what our, our blog looks like. And, and it's basically where all of the editorial kind of content is. Our website, if you go to that bikes.msu.edu, will take you to our, this web page, which as you can see from up above, it changes to this big long address. Um, it's a vendor that we use, so don't let that alarm you. It is our official website. And from here, you can shop for new and pre-owned or used bikes, um, information about our repairs, our rentals, and other services, and some accessories that we also sell and maybe selling more of online if we start shipping. So that's kind of the difference. Uh, so back to our blog, if you click on bike commuter resources here, scroll down, you'll see where we have a bunch of different services that we pulled together and put on one page so that everybody can see what we offer. If they're maybe thinking about coming to MSU as a student or faculty or staff, they can kind of see all the things that we're offering. Which, uh, by the way, we're, today there should be a national announcement that MSU is getting upgraded to be a, a gold level bike friendly university. So the stuff that we've been doing at MSU to make it more bike friendly has really been making a difference and we're getting some nice national recognition later today. Excellent, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's been about five years since uh, we won the silver award and now, so we've moved up to gold, which is pretty exciting. Anyway, um, so you can you can browse through here and I'll, I'll be talking about some of these some of these items here as we go, but let's go back to the, the presentation that I've thrown together. And, you know, this is a picture of a, a friend who used to work at MSU, Laura, and she had this beautiful setup for her commuter bike. And you know, I thought that was a great picture of, you know, what a bike commuter can look like. And, oftentimes do look like and it's she's she's got a lot of the elements of a nice warmer weather bike commute setup that she's demonstrating there with a nice smile on her face you know she's got the helmet and fenders full fenders uh, the bike is a nice easy on easy off kind of frame which makes it really easy for casual cycling to for commuting purposes it's nice and upright so that she doesn't have to lean way over. And it so that gets her head up so that she, she can see more of what's going on on the street as she's commuting. So it's a nice, safe riding position. Uh, it's not the riding position for someone that wants to go faster, you know, for longer distances, but it's a nice, comfortable position for commuting. You can see she's got baskets to throw her stuff in. Although baskets, you know, you need to put something over the top of them if you don't want to lose your content. So she might, you know, put something like they do make what's called a cargo net, which we sell and other bike shops sell. It just helps keep contents in, in a basket. Um, you can also put, as I've done on my bike that I'll show a picture of uh, a pannier, which is just a, a fabric um, bag that can hang on, onto the side of a rack. So if you've got a rack, then you can either go with these baskets, which these are folding ba wire baskets. So when they're empty, you can fold them up. And so they're more compact, but they do tend to be heavier uh, and also they rattle. So that's, for me, I don't like rattles and noises from my bike. So I find that kind of annoying, but anyway, I just thought that was a cute picture. So why do we, it is. why do we, <laughs> I'll let her know. Um, so why do we commute um, or why do we encourage commuting and why did MSU decide to uh, fund this, this bike center back in 2006. Well, it's primarily to, to encourage people to ride their bikes and to help them enjoy their bike riding and to help facilitate that. But this, this um, meme, I guess you might call it, or illustration is, you see a lot of different variations of this, but um, you know, it, it kind of demonstrates, there's, there's another one that's probably more commonplace than this one where you have a bus it shows a picture of a bus and all these people that can ride on a bus this one happens to be 
you know, yeah, electric vehicles and whatnot or Ubers are cool sounding and do also have some advantages to our reducing emissions and things of that sort, but they don't necessarily reduce the congestion on our roads. So I think this is a nice demonstration that a car, whether it's an EV or um, Uber, um, is still a car and it's taking up space on the roads and it's also requiring more road maintenance, uh, parking services, parking infrastructure, which is very expensive. So, you know, I, I like this illustration for that point that um, bikes are still a great way to go. That or walking, you know, if you live within a mile or two of campus, you can certainly easily walk that distance. But anyway, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, and if you're on campus, this site in between classes will probably hit home with you. And every time I go out uh, during the day and a nice day like this, and I see these kinds of traffic jams on campus in between classes, I just think, why would anyone put up with this? You know, it's like you can be in, you know, with, with us being here in the center of campus, I can jump on my bike and be anywhere on campus within about five to seven minutes. I could see this just to get from through this little queue right here, this line of cars, it could take five minutes just to get up to that stop sign. Uh, so it's just an illustration of on our campus from a couple of years ago, just how much traffic there is in between classes. So a lot of faculty and staff know this and they know to avoid class change times, but still it's, wow, I, I, I don't get it, but a lot of people just drive themselves from class to class or building to building and and then they're late for things and they say, oh, I couldn't find parking and everyone nods their head and understanding, but it's like, really? And I'll tell parents that your student, if they use a bike, they can save probably an almost an hour a day in getting around campus. And you add that up over the, the whole year, it's just a phenomenal time savings just by using a bike rather than walking or driving or even taking a bus. And we, we also, you know, riding a bike is great for our health. And this is a little ad that I found from the early 1900s and it's still a great message, especially this past year as we've all been battling the, uh, the virus. So this one was about, might've been around 1918 when, when the 1918 flu hit. Um, but anyway, that's the health benefits are are tremendous as well. And I, I look at it as my daily exercise when I ride to work. Twice a day, I get a nice workout coming in and a nice workout going home. You know, it helps me get my mind ready and my body ready, de-stress for the day, and then helps me de-stress from a busy day going home. So I, I find it's just something I look forward to. And, and not many people look forward to their commute, but bicycle commuters certainly can look forward to, to their commute time, which is pretty cool. So we, in our brochure, our print brochure over the years, we've provided a map of campus and all the bike related infrastructure on campus. And this map, we just updated about a year ago and, and it shows all of the uh, campus related bike friendly facilities. Uh, the green lines indicating which roads have bike lanes now. Um, shows pretty much everything that we've been investing in and just a lot of this is, has been constructed and added to campus just since the year 2000, believe it or not. So we've come a real long ways. In fact, in the year 2000, that's when the university administrators decided to basically enact what has since become known as complete streets as a design concept or guiding principle that anytime a road is, a new road is constructed or, or a ro older road is reconstructed, that it be done so to make it safe for, for all road users and not just for motor vehicles. So MSU started that in the year 2000 and, and way ahead of its time. Uh, complete streets as a concept didn't start up for maybe five to 10 years after that. Um, so now we're at the university probably has 80 plus percent of our 
around 80% of our roads that are planned to have bike facilities having bike lanes. And uh, just as a quick update, the Bogue Street protected bike lane, I don't know if any of you use that, but that bike lane as it was the area's mid Michigan's first protected bike lane and that pilot was done in the fall of 2019. And it was wildly successful so much so that the university decided they were going to install it in 2020 but then that got uh, unfortunately postponed. Uh, we still anticipate that that's going to happen maybe this coming year. We hope if there's still funds available. Uh, and then in that in that document that talked about completing this as a permanent installation, they talked about also connecting to a protected bike lane across Shaw. So we're pressing, we being campus bike advocates, we're, we're pressing for a safe connected east-west corridor through the center of campus. And it, mm -hmm. we're not sure if uh, North Shaw is going to become the one road or maybe both south shaw and north shaw will become will have a one of the lanes dedicated to be a protected bike lane but you know that remains to be seen that that deep level of detail hasn't been decided yet but i'll point out too that the the new msu to lake lansing pathway is coming in and it's going to come right up to campus right about here where shaw the shaws connect at hagedorn so there's going to be a bunch of new traffic pedestrian and bike traffic coming right to Hagedorn back and forth from here so it only makes sense to get Shaw's safer for bikes and scooters and other micro mobility modes uh, from this point all the way across campus mm -hmm. so there, there's going to also be a, a flashing pedestrian beacon crossing crosswalk added right here at, at Hagedorn I've heard so that'll be a really nice addition since for years people have been complaining about how hard it is to get back and forth here to get to the MSU Community Music School. So anyway, that's just a little bit of news. To help you with your commute, um, TCBA, which is the, the Tri-County Bike Association, they've created something that in print for about 10 years has been known as the Crosstown Map Booklet. And we do have some print versions of this, but online you can go to biketcba.org. It's also linked off this page here. You go down here to TCBA, there's a link to the Crosstown Map page right here. But anyway, this will show you all of the recommended routes or routes around the area or Tri-County area that are, are not safe. So the red being considered not safe, green being ones that are recommended and have nice, safe uh, bike facilities along them. And this is all the work of primarily one person. So it, it's, it's got problems and some errors and I try to provide feedback. So, you know, it's like anything online, the real world uh, uh, may be different than what is presented here, but this is, this is pretty good. Um, unfortunately, my commute closest direct route is up and down Grand River. So it's red, you know, and it's not certainly not anything I'd recommend for beginners, but I, I've been riding up and down Grand River for 40 years. So it's, it's not that big a deal for me. So it also relates to your level of confidence and experience. So what kind of bike makes a good commuter bike? Let's get back to the bike equipment. Uh, this is just a Japanese bike that has an umbrella hole, which I think is pretty comical. I actually, my wife is Japanese and I go back and forth to Japan quite often. And I, I bought one of these umbrella holders and played around with it for a time. And it's kind of, kind of humorous, uh, but they do actually use these in Japan, believe it or not. Uh, this is a great little city bike, which in Japan and most Asia and Europe, you know, almost all of the department, you go to a big box store and you buy bikes that are already equipped with lights and baskets and fenders and chain guards and kickstands. Everything is on there just like, you know, if you went to buy a car, the car would have all those things as well. So it's, uh, we're a bit 
behind a lot of other countries in in that sense. Um, but I think you know we are starting to see more and more commuter bikes come out that that do have the features of a good commuter bike. Uh, let me just jump ahead a second. We've got a we've had been, we've been a Jameis dealer, and this is a good example of a a commuter bike that's mostly probably 90% of the way there. You know, it's got the nice fenders, it's got a chain guard, it's got a rack already. It's nice and upright, comes with a bell. Um, so there are some of the companies like Jameis that we represent and uh, you know, are starting to offer nice, well-equipped commuter bikes. Uh, I would just add some lights and some other things to this and a pannier to make it a complete, nice commuter bike. So back to the mountain bikes, old mountain bikes make a great commuter bike uh, and great for several respects. I, you know, they're inexpensive. There's a lot of them. This is my uh, winter bike right now. You know, I added the fenders. It's nice and upright. Um, put some lights on it. This was shortly after I bought it. But the, the fatter tires are really nice for city commuting since you know, you never know. Well, I guess we probably know that most of our roads are really beat up and they're probably not going to be improved anytime soon. So having a fatter tire bike really does make your commute much more comfortable and safer because this picture, this is my warm weather commuter bike, which has got skinnier wheels, skinnier tires, but this sort of thing can happen on a commute. Yes. My wheel, my skinny wheel nice weather bike if i'm not really careful i could drop a wheel into one of these linear cracks which this is on my commute and that could easily crash you and damage your wheel and ruin your day so the fatter tire bike like this that tire is not going to go down into those kind of linear cracks and if you did hit a pothole you wouldn't necessarily crash as you might on a skinnier tired bike now let me just briefly mention this this is a Kind of like the mountain bike in the previous photo this is a an 80s touring bike actually early 80s and touring bikes also make great commuter bikes and there's quite a few a lot of them out there in the wild so you can get them fairly inexpensively uh, they came with racks they didn't necessarily come with fenders but they generally have room for fenders nice full fenders um, you know you can put all kinds of other accessories on them you, i changed the stem out and I put a different handlebar on it to get my riding position more upright. And as you can kind of see, I've also got aero bars on here because I like to go fast. And I also use this when riding out in the country with friends or for longer rides. So I've got a pretty, a pretty flexible setup here. Um, it's my tool bag with spare tires or tube and some tools in there. Uh, I've got a tail, tail light here and I've got a headlight on my helmet, which I'll show you later. This tail light, by the way, has a built in video camera. So it's capturing video evidence of people that might cause me harm or harass me. Um, this is the, a type of pannier that is called a grocery pannier, which is just a fabric uh, open top bag of sorts that has this. Um, an aluminum rod that keeps it open or you can fold it closed if you're not commuting and not carrying a load and then i just take i pack my backpack in the house with my lunch and whatever else and drop it in this and off i go rather than having to pack a pannier that with individual pockets and put that on I, I just find that this grocery pannier works really well and no it's it doesn't really cause any problems to just have it on one side of the bike. It feels a little funny for about five minutes, maybe three minutes, your very first ride. And after that, you really don't even notice that you only have a load on one side of the bike. Any questions at all about this goofy uh, commuter bike? I like my rear mount kickstand. A lot of kickstands are right mounted right here on a bike. And, and if you've got a heavier load on the rear, it, can sometimes swing around and the bike bikes tend to fall over with a common center mount kickstand. So these rear mount kickstands are really nice. Um, 
Uh, one other thing I'll point out, this little bottle-like looking thing here, that's actually an air horn, which I have to use occasionally. And when I need it, I'm glad I have it just to let people know I'm there. So there's the, what to wear. Uh, get on to clothing here. This is Thomas, one of our campus uh, daily commuters. He rides year round. This is a good example of, um, you know, a nice, he's got a, a light, highly visible shell as a windbreaker and, and also to make sure people see him when he's out commuting. It's a great, great jacket there. It's also got some reflectivity in it, as you can see. He's using a backpack, which I used a backpack for my commuting for close to 20 years. And then when I started using a pannier, got that monkey off my back, it was just wonderful. So if you've been using a backpack, just get a pannier and you won't, you'll wonder why you lived with a, using a backpack all those years, especially in the summer months when it's hot, because you tend to just sweat so much with, um, with a backpack on. A um, couple other things, the goggles, your eyes are really an important part. You know, if you can't see, you know, you're likely to get into trouble. So I always am either wearing sunglasses or, and I'll try to keep a pair of clear glasses, like safety glasses in my backpack during the warm months of the year. And then in the winter, these, uh, we sell these, these are basically uh, chem lab goggles and they can go over, over re, uh, glasses if you have prescription glasses or they can even go over smaller sunglasses. But those are, it's a good way to keep your, also these have a nice uh, rubber gasket for, you know, to keep your breath from fogging up your, your glasses in the winter. So those are great eye protection. So lights, uh, he doesn't, his helmet doesn't have a, a headlight on it. I like to have a headlight on my helmet. I'll show you that later uh, because you get the light right where you see it, right where you're looking, that is. Tail lights are a must, but you should also have a reflector. So some good, better tail lights have both a reflector built into it and a light. The reflector, the rear reflector is required by law. So I've heard of court cases that were lost simply because the cyclists, even though they had really bright rear lights, they didn't have a rear reflector. So they were able to get their client off the hook from hitting them because they didn't have a reflector, which makes absolutely no common sense, but that's what's in the law is that you have to have a rear reflector. So uh, a, a reflector is called passive, a passive safety device. Um, a rear light is an active device. You really need both. I don't know if any of you have seen cars driving around without their headlights on, but I've been noticing more and more of them and even modern newer looking vehicles driving around after dark even without their headlights on. And it's just mind boggling that that happens. But if you're only running around with reflectors on, you're kind of relying on the cars to be using their headlights when they should be. And, you know, say only 5% of the drivers are not using their, you don't really want to take that chance. So make sure you've got a good, some good strong taillights. And I actually use two. I have one as a backup in case the other one burns out because I'm on Grand River. I really want to make sure people see me. And I'll also use two headlights for the, for the same reason. So don't be a ninja. Wear, use lights. That's my favorite graphic on that topic. I, I had a little, I taught classes for kids and I found out a year later from this kid's grandpa that after that lecture, he went home and he was talking about, don't be a ninja with all of his friends for a long, long time after that, after seeing that graphic, <laughs> I'm glad. Mm -hmm. So here's an example of a, uh, just kind of a camping headlight that you can put zip tie onto a helmet. They also make specific helmet lights that I'll show you in a second. Um, this was a setup that I was using for a short time. Um, I really didn't like the cable and all that. So I went to a, just a battery operated um, headlight that I'll show you in a bit. So baskets versus racks. Um, if, you know, there's baskets that, these are some baskets and racks that we sell in the shop. This is a photo taken in our showroom. Um, 
so the baskets you see here are mostly front baskets that have legs, which is what will help you support a load. Um, and then some of them that we also have here, you see this black one down here, that's one of the folding baskets that needs one of these racks to mount to. So the racks are like 25 bucks. The baskets are like, I don't know, 15 or 20 bucks. And then we can install them for you for, for I forget, is it 10 or $15, Aubrey? Maybe more. Depends on what it is. But just about any bike can, you can add a baskets and racks them to make them more practical. So I highly recommend that. This, this rack is actually a front rack. So you can, you can put this on the front and then you can tie a, another basket to it to even carry more weight. And we also have racks for bikes that have disc brakes in the back. So that's what this rack is for. Some more baskets that we have. Some of these baskets that are just simply easy on, easy off. They don't really support much weight. And they can also be stolen. So it's best if they're bolted on. If you're, if you're having to lock your bike up during the day outside, especially, you want to make sure things are bolted on. Um, back to fenders. This is a, an example of a full fender, a plastic fender that, that we um, sell in the shop. And full fenders provide full coverage. So they're also known as full coverage fenders. And they're, they're just wonderful. You really, a, a good commuter bike, kind of like a car or a motorcycle, you know, should really have full fenders. You know, the, the rear is also important, not only just to keep it off your backside, but it helps keep spray off your friends if you happen to be riding with someone else. Uh, the front also has a little flap. I, I, I use a longer flap because uh, I want that spray from the front wheel to not soak my feet if I happen to be riding in, on wet streets. So a full set of fenders is really nice. And we also stock some, some better looking ones that are aluminum that we can install for you as well. So this is a slightly older picture, but you know there are some easy on, easy off kind of fenders just for your rear end. And a lot of people come in on the first rain of the fall and they just want something to cover their rear end and they don't really care about their feet and everything else. So we do stock these kind of fenders as well. They're also known as beaver tail fenders, like these PDWs that look like a beaver tail. You can also take a, a fender like this and strap it on right here. And this was one of my last winter bike. And with my winter studded tires on here, there wasn't enough room left here to put a full fender through the fork. So you can then in a case like that, you can also just add on a, a, a fender right like this. So that's an example of sometimes you have to be creative. And speaking of creativity, there's a bike that was my daughter's when she was still going to school here. And I, uh, she mangled it. The rear fender either wouldn't fit around this big fat tire or it got destroyed somehow. But I basically just used an, a you know, like a Windex gallon jug or a milk jug and just cut it up and zip tie it on and made her a fender. It was the right price. And I was bored that day, I guess. So you can, you can get creative and make your own. This guy, one of our customers who is the do-it-yourselfer of the century, he, uh, every time he comes in, he's done something creative and he's used an old tire, cut it up and made a flap, a mud flap extension of keep the stuff from coming up. Pretty creative guy. He loves using inner tubes too, as you can see. Anyway, let, any questions about any fenders or anything of that sort? And I muted you, Laura. I'm sorry, I was hearing some background noise there. So if you want to ask any questions, uh, unmute yourself. I apologize for the noise I was making. Oh, that's fine. Uh, okay. Hearing none, so let's talk a little bit about riding through the winter. So that's a picture of my last winter bike. Um, and we already talked about it a little bit, but I, I, I use these uh, things on the handlebars called bar mitts. Well, bar mitts is actually a brand, but essentially that's kind of like the Kleenex term in the world of uh, 
handlebar coverings for winter riding. So you can also see that I was using big wire baskets on my last winter bike. I had a tail light here, still had lights on from Silver Bells where I had lights all over the bike. Still had a speaker here, which I like using during the warm months for a little bit of music. Anyway, back to Thomas, he's uh, probably the most, uh, well, he rides the most, I think of any of our campus bike commuters. And this is his winter bike. And he keeps it this clean by spraying it down once a week, he says, with a simple like, solution of some simple green and water in his basement, and then he dries it off. But he, um, yeah, this is a wonderful winter commuter bike example. He's also got an air horn on this bike right there. He's got uh, lots of lights, tail lights, headlights. Um, he's got disc brakes on this one, which disc brakes are nice for your commuter bikes. We didn't really talk about that aspect of a good commuter bike, but disc brakes are, they came from the mountain bike world and they, they really do a good job of stopping you in all weather conditions, wet or dry. So that's one advantage to disc brakes if you're out shopping for a bike. Rim brakes can, you know, when the, when the rims get wet, the, the braking power can go down drastically. So you want to just keep that in mind. It, if you keep your brakes well adjusted and good in good working order, you, you shouldn't have an issue, but you certainly don't want to find out that your brakes don't work when you need them. So something to consider. Uh, another riding jacket. He's got nice bright colors in all of his riding wear. So this is my winter, my really cold winter set up and this is the jacket that I wear these days. It's, um, you know, I don't have that far to, to ride in the winter. I, I drive my, my uh, vehicle with my bike in it. I keep my bike in my minivan and then I park where it's free near campus. So I only have about a mile to ride into the shop. So that's, I call that commuter light. You know, so you don't necessarily have to ride your bike all the way from, from home every time you can think about driving part of the way in or taking the bus, putting your bike on the bus. All of the catabuses have a couple, two, three position bike racks on the front that hold two or three bikes. I think they might all be three bike racks now. Uh, so you can combine your, your commute modes to get back and forth to work. Um, so having a safety vest on just gives me a little more visibility. Looks dorky, but I don't really care. Um, there's my helmet with the kind of headlight that I'm using these days. It's my night rider. So I have light right where I'm looking. These are my chem lab goggles. So fashionable. Yeah. So some people worry about their bikes uh, when they're outside all the time. And this guy, I just happened across this. I'm like, what is that? I guess that was his way of protecting it. He would put that tin foil on and off every day to protect his bike parts to prevent them from rusting. So one solution to this is we we manage two different secure bike parking facilities that are covered and secured so people don't mess with your bike during the day. This one is down at the Trowbridge parking ramp. It's inside the, the waiting area for the bus station down there. So we have uh, parking spaces for 25 bikes down there and it also features a do-it-yourself station with a bike, uh, an air pump. So we manage this. So if you would like, you can uh, back on our blog. If you go here, right here, secure covered bike parking in the MSU bike garages, you can learn more about that that service. You can see more pictures, and yeah, it's it's a, a service that we charge minimally for, uh, but it works through your, your MSU security card and only MSU community people can use this service as a result. So we have this one down at the Trowbridge parking ramp, which is down by the Comarts College or the police station. And then this one on the north end at the Grand River parking ramp, this holds 50 bikes. It's not heated, like this one is heated and well lit. Uh, this one is not heated, it is lit. Um, same system, 
same security system. It's just these windows over here are not closed. So on this end over here, you can get some snow and rain coming in. So you have all this space on this side, which unfortunately the, the, both of these have been very underutilized. So please make use of them. Let your friends know they are here. Um, one of the concepts that we hoped would have taken off was people that drive, live maybe in Brighton or further away, drive here, have their bike locked up here and then take their bike the last mile or so to their office, but just can't seem to get anyone to think beyond driving as close as possible to their building and walking in. But it's, a, it's another way to think about your commute. Keep a bike in one of these cages or if you have a really nice bike and you don't want it messed with during the day, you can ride your really nice bike here, lock it, and then take your crappy bike, which you then lock up out of the rack, and then you don't have to worry about being messed with because it's a junky bike and you, you know, don't worry about people vandalizing or stealing it. So it's another way to possibly use these facilities. That's my winter bike again. I won't go on further about that. I just like these pictures. You can see this, I added this little mud flap to my fender just to give a little more coverage. Another thing I'll point out, this double kickstand here is really nice for bikes. If you're carrying a heavy load, a two, two leg kickstand is really nice. And we do stock those. Studded tires are a really awesome thing to have. These are commercially available tires that we stock and they work really well. These carbide, these studs are made of carbide steel so they don't wear down hardly at all. Each winter, you can probably get three or four winters out of the use of these studded tires. And I also have a do-it-yourself studded tire um, set of instructions. I've made a lot of these. I can make them in about a pair of them in about a half an hour's time, and they work really well. They're very inexpensive. These are the Bar Mitz brand that we can order for you, we don't stock them in the shop. They're maybe 30, 40, $50 perhaps. So they make them both for drop bar bikes like this and for flat bar, flat bar bikes as well to keep your hands toasty warm. And, and then you can wear like a lighter glove or something inside so you can use your shifters and brakes. Any questions about any of the winter biking stuff? No, but that was terrific. Oh, thanks. Um, I guess I didn't mention your feet in the winter. Well, Aubrey, you said you found some some hacks. Do you want to talk about the hacks that you learned about what you can do to keep your feet warm or dry? Yeah. Um, so let me switch no. over to you. Your large view. How do I switch to live view? Uh, I'm trying to pin you. Hold on a second. I don't know. I see Aubrey. Yeah, do you see? Is he filling your screen? He I'm was. Not, when I talk, when I talk, do I fill the screen up? I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Maybe yes. that'll help. Okay. You do. I stopped. Oh, okay. here. So maybe that maybe that'll work then. There you go. Take it. We um. Well, I think the first thing you can do is wear a pair of wool socks. That's great, actually, in the summer or the winter. Um, and I like to do what I can to keep my feet from getting wet in the first place. So, you know, the full fenders work great. Uh, having some kind of waterproof, you know, hiking boot or something is great. Um, I have done in the past used, uh, I don't know, they used to be called rubbers, but those kind of like little plastic or little rubber booties that slip on over your shoes. And those can be really effective. Um, you can also, you know, do the tried and true uh, bread bag over your feet and then put them inside your shoes. That'll at least keep your feet dry. Um, your shoes, your shoes might not be dry. Um, wow, that's a lot better. Um, but it reminded me of uh, how to dry your shoes out faster with newspaper. So what I've done before is you know, coming to work, my shoes are wet from the ride. Uh, if you take them off and stuff them full of crumpled up newspapers, that absorbs a lot of the water. 
And I've definitely had the experience where they are dry by the time I'm riding home. So sometimes you have to change the newspaper a couple times, but that really good does does wonders to suck that water out of the, the shoe itself. So that's been helpful uh, at times for me. Sure. Um, I really like the theory though, just to keep your feet from getting wet. So I think like if there's one thing you can add to your bike, it's fenders. And they're not super useful on those dry days, but on the wet days, it's like really a game changer. Uh, and even on a dry day, there might be a puddle you're splashing through or some, some mud and you know, they're gonna keep all that stuff off of you and your, uh, your bike. Um, try to bring some stuff in. Oh yeah, so as far as visibility, I kind of had it here in the, in, the, in the chat about road safety. So, you know, lights are good even during the day. Um, the high visibility vests are good because you can just kind of put them on over whatever clothes you're wearing. Um, I've been using reflective tape on my bike for a long time and that can be kind of fun to do things. Um, I found this cool product called, uh, you know, there's like those fluorescent safety flags you can put on the back of your, your bike. Um, but I found this cool product called a safety pizza. Um, so it's like one of those reflective flags. Um, it comes with the, uh, the toppings separate. So you get to dress your own pizza. Um, you can see that these two uh, ingredients are different, but and they, they make them in a smaller size as well. So you can kind of tap on your backpack. Um, but these are a lot of fun. I mean, from far away, they just look like a fluorescent safety flag, but the closer you get it, it becomes obvious that it's pizza. And I've gotten many uh, friendly waves and com compliments on my reflective flag. Um, so these are something that may, we might start carrying in the shop, but you can get them uh, from Safety Pizza. Search for that. Uh, but these are really nice. Um, you mentioned the bells. Yeah, you know, the other thing, it's not super useful for uh, motor motor vehicles, but uh, for pedestrians, it's nice to have a bell. Um, I mean, you can try yelling at them or whatever, but, you know, I always think that, uh, you know, this is like the really, this is like a really, really loud one. Um, and I feel like a gentle, a gentle bell from, you know, 100 feet away lets people know that you're coming. And if they're still not getting out of your way, you can kind of ding it, you know, as you get closer to them. So the bells are kind of nice, I think, just because it's, it's kind of a pleasant sound. Um, on a bike, I, you know, I've I worked as many years as a messenger, so I was spending a lot of time like out in the world. And the last thing I want to be doing is to yell, you having to yell at people all the time, and just kind of turning that interaction into something kind of negative. So I just like say, oh, good morning, you know, loudly from behind them, or I you know, ring my bell and kind of a pleasant sound anyway so uh having a bell is kind of nice um should have mentioned this um you know i had worn a backpack for many years and i started uh, really in earnest trying to figure out how to get the weight off of my body and onto my bike you know so racks and baskets uh, can really be useful for that i'm actually going to see if i can turn my camera around and show you um, my bike This one, so you know, I kind of have a setup. It's a. Uh, oh, you want some over here? Uh, I ended up using a frame that was easier to get off and on. So even with my, you know, big winter uh, winter boots, it's easier to kind of get off and on. Um, I do have it set up with the the full fenders. I always like to have the water on the bike also. You know, water is really heavy and carrying a water bottle is like a lot of extra weight that you don't need to be carrying. So I just like always have my water bottle on the bike. Um, I do have a, a rack. I almost never put stuff on it, um, but it's a good place to mount my tail light. Um, and this one does have the built-in reflector, which is nice to have. Um, I took my safety pizza off. So normally I have my safety pizza back here. Um, which is making it highly visible from the back. I see you've got the, uh, the rear mount kickstand too, which oh, yeah. is similar to one. So oh, that helps. Um, you know, I have all this weight up front, so a lot of times the kickstand is a little bit wonky, but uh, it's better than nothing. 
Um, I have found that a nice wide flat pedal is good too, because any kind of shoe or boot, you know, just can kind of step right on it. Um, toe straps or clipless pedals, um, you just have to wear a special foot footwear. Um, so I just like a nice flat pedal that you can just put an annual shoe on. Um, I choose to carry all my stuff in, in a basket. So um, I actually have this little bag, which is nice. And it fits, you know, just fits right into the basket. Um, you can load everything in here. It does have like a reflective, a reflective strip on the front. And then I've added uh, some reflective flags to the front as well. So these will flip around and I, I hope they're visible. That's the idea anyway. Um, have you strapped your bag down to the basket? In some way, uh, is well, that what these little clips yeah, are these, for? I can actually clip. It, I can actually clip this in on both sides. Oh, so okay. It doesn't go flying off. Um, nice. I guess in the past I've just put like some sort of bungee cord. Like if I just put my backpack in there, I usually put a bungee cord across it uh, to help keep that in there from, from bouncing out. Um, nice bell there. Yeah, there's a new bell. Um, this has kind of a sweet, uh, sweet sound to it. Um, I do like to sit more more upright, especially on a commute. Um, just makes me better visibility for I mean for me to see and also to be seen. Um, you know, I, I had a handlebar that allowed me to do that. Um, a lot of mountain bikes always have a straight handlebar, which kind of gets me in a more crouched over position. Um, but a handlebar like this allows me to sit more upright, and you know it's really easy to you know just take a straight you know straight handlebar off a mountain bike and put on something. You know, like this, um, it's usually a pretty affordable upgrade that makes a huge difference in your riding position. Um, and so, yeah, so I kind of have mine set up this way. Nice. Um, I don't have, I don't oftentimes have a light on my handlebars. Uh, sometimes this blocks the light. So I've actually mounted the light down low. Nice. Uh, what are the advantages of having it lower? I've heard there are some. Um, well, in this case, it makes it visible at all. Um, but I think having a lower to the ground, if there are some bumps or potholes, it casts a bigger shadow. So the lower the light is, the easier it is to kind of see the road surface and as far as what you're going to be uh, having to deal with. Yeah, and that's one disadvantage I've heard about having the helmet light or just a helmet light because it's so close to your eyes that you really can't perceive depth potholes or rocks and things of that sort so why don't we switch and i'll show and tell a little bit thanks for showing us your bike there aubrey yeah this is my current winter well my day around the year-round helmet uh i like to have a higher vis colorful helmet, just anything I can to make more visible, I do. I got this light up here, which it's got a battery self-contained, so I don't have any cables or anything to worry about. And I can use it for other things as well, like walking the dog. It just clips on there. And this particular one, some of them come with the helmet mount uh, from the manufacturer. So yeah, that's my helmet. Now, some helmets you can, you, or you can get helmet covers to help prevent airflow through the helmet to make your head cold. I just use a balaclava, it goes over my over the face mask, and it's thin enough I can wear that under my helmet. So when you're shopping for a helmet, I always tell people to get one that's a little bit on the larger size so that you can fit hats, so other things underneath it. So Try to keep that in mind when you're if you're buying a new helmet, get one on a little bit on the large side. My hands get really cold in the winter, so I, I prefer on really cold days, I'll just use mittens. So this nice heavyweight mittens. And even on these really cold days, mittens, even with my bar mitts, my hands still get cold and mittens inside these just for riding about less than 10 minutes. My hands are just that sensitive. Um, I use just a pair of winter goggles. I find these very, very comfortable and they've got some tint in there as well. So riding when it's light out, you know, cuts down on the, on the sun 
glare from the snow. It nice, keeps the fog out too. Um, so here's my secondary backup light. When it's night and dark out, I, I don't use the flash, but during the day, I'll use that flash so that people see me coming and it's a to be seen light. So there's two different types of lights, lights to be seen and lights to see where you're going. So the one on my helmet is really powerful so I can light up to see where I'm going. Uh, and then that one to let people know that, that I'm there. So yeah, I've got my mud flap on these fenders now, nice cow pattern, got platform pedals, kind of like Aubrey was showing on his bike, a water bottle, got two tail lights. So I've got a backup. And uh, yeah, got my reflector down here as well on the on the fender. So we'll go back to the computers and see if you have any questions. Um, be right sure. back. Oh, I hope the camera work was okay. Uh, with the little webcam, I, there's no screen or anything. So hopefully I was pointing at the right stuff. You were, it was great. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm back. Thanks for joining us. Are you, are there any, since there's only two people in attendance, we, we feel free to ask questions. You don't have to be embarrassed. There aren't that many people here. Very <laughs> small group. This is Laura. I, um, I don't think I have any questions right now. Um, I, I, it's a lot of information to take in. I've, I've been a um, just pleasure writer my whole life, but, um, I bought one of your bikes a year ago and uh, in riding longer distances and I, I'll be in to get my bike tuned up and to buy things that I need like a bell and excellent. I need to think about lights. I um, currently don't ride at night at all and I've got the reflectors, but um, I'll talk to you about whether I should do something about lights. Yeah, what, one thing about lights and since I'm on the board of a national organization called the Riot of Silence, I spend a great deal of time thinking and writing about the topic of trying to reduce the chance of being hit on our bikes. And yeah. one thing I've done, I looked at the stats on crash reports here in Michigan, and you're, I was really surprised once I started being able to get access to the crash reports, the actual reports and crunch the numbers that there's just a huge percentage of crashes, injury crashes or fatal crashes that happen during essentially what are daylight hours. So yeah. a lot of bicyclists, they think of lighting in, in terms of like what you just said, don't ride at night so I don't need to have lights. Well, I, I recommend using lights all the time just so people are more aware of you because there's just so many distractions and they're on their phones and they're, yes. you know, there's, all kinds of things going on visually, daytime or at low light time. So just keep that in mind and just think about your visibility as a all the time kind of issue and not just after dark. Yeah. You know, I've also seen people that are obviously fitness riders and they're coming, maybe coming back, coming back home from a long ride when it's almost dark and they're dressed in their black jerseys with no lights. And I'm just thinking that's just, asking for it so you got to think about how you know when you're going out for a ride in the evening what are your what's the light going to do while you're on your ride and when you're coming home you, you certainly yeah. don't want to uh, forget about that uh, on your ride home especially you know like I mentioned earlier like I'll wear sunglasses all the time but when I'm riding home after a social ride um, the Lansing bike party we ride every Friday during the warmer months of the year. And I like to just keep a pair of clear safety glasses for my ride home in the dark because I don't want flies and bugs and other things getting in my eyes while I'm riding home at night. 
Uh, I should also mention that through February, you mentioned getting your bike tuned up. We are we are offering 20% uh, off tune-ups, not the parts, but uh, off the labor, which okay. rarely do that. Uh, it's Our labor is normally $65 for a basic tune-up, so you might want to yeah. take advantage of that. And, and, and we're also able to sp look, spend more time uh, with your bike than we would during the busy time of the year. So your bike gets a lot more attention and de detail work if you bring it in when it's when it's slow and that's true with any bike shop thank you yeah yeah you're welcome carla you've been kind of quieter you don't have any questions or comments no but my son is taking in all the stuff and gadgets he wants to buy now <laughs> <laughs> did he like our bikes more gadgets <laughs> yeah, he likes the outfit, the uh, outfitted bikes. Oh, yeah. Well, cool. Well, thanks again for joining us. And um, yeah, I hope, uh, I think we may have covered all the material for our intermediate class as well, Aubrey. <laughs> we'll have to give it some more thought for, for next week. And then Aubrey's <laughs> going to be doing the la very last class about reimagining your bike. So maybe that'll appeal to... Oh one of you too, that um, you'll be talking about how you can take your your old road bike and maybe turn it into a nice commuter bike or take your old road bike or touring bike and turn it into a gravel bike, which is all the rage, or turn it into a hybrid. So mm -hmm. we'll be talking about about that in, in the last class of the session of the series, I should say. I might need to sign up for those. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Thank you. Yeah, thanks again. And uh, shoot us an email if you have other things that come up later at bikes at msu.edu. Or you can call us uh, at our main line. That's 432-3400. And uh, look for news later today about us winning the gold uh, Bike Friendly University Award. That should have come out by now, but we'll see what's up with that. But it's supposed to be announced nationally today, all the new Bike Friendly University Awards. Wonderful. Anyway, stay upright. Thank you for your time and expertise. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, yeah, thanks guys. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye now. <laughs>